I'm standing in front of Niagara Falls, specifically the Horseshoe Falls. It's an iconic scene. Such beauty, such power. Ooh, power. Maybe we could use that for something. In 1893, the Niagara Falls Park and River Railroad began running a railway between Chippewa, just upstream of the falls, and Queenston, several kilometers downstream. Now, the upper river is navigable all the way from Lake Erie to Chippewa, and the lower river is navigable all the way from Lake Ontario to Queenston. So a railway between those two points would not only serve tourists, it could also act as a shuttle between the two boats. The railroad was powered by its own hydroelectric generating station located right near here in the Table Rock area. The railroad went out of business in the 1930s, and today almost no traces of it remain. The railway may have been the first company to build a hydroelectric generating plant in Niagara Falls, but it wasn't alone for long. Just over a decade later, three more plants opened in the span of just about a year. This magnificent building behind me is the first one. This is the Ranking Generating Station, which opened in 1905. It was built by the Canadian Niagara Power Company and named after the company's boss, William Rankin, who died just a few days after this plant opened. Strangely though, it took them a couple of decades to name the plant after him. When it was originally constructed, it had five turbines and generators based on a design by some dude named Tesla. You might have heard of him. No, not him. Yeah, that guy. Eventually, it had 11 generators, and the water exited from a tunnel below the base of the falls. This station was in operation for just over a century, closing in 2006. The building has now been repurposed into a tourist attraction called the Power Station. If you're interested in this kind of thing, it, you might be interested in uh, dropping by and having a look at it, but please finish watching the video first. All right, now for the next station. We're going to stay in 1905, but we're going to head a bit downstream. The building in the lower left, with vegetation growing on its roof, is the Ontario Power Company Generating Station, which also opened in 1905. As you can see, this one is down in the gorge. It doesn't really matter where the building is, the water has to come from the river above the falls, and it has to fall from there toward turbines near the level of the bottom of the gorge, but the rest of the infrastructure can go wherever you want to put it. The water for this plant was taken near the Dufferin Islands upstream of the falls. The building at the inlet still exists, and it looks much less damp than the generating station. This plant operated for just under a century. It was shut down in 1999. The location of its former transformer building is part of the site of the Niagara Falls View Casino, which made an appearance in my previous Niagara Falls video. There's a magic link on the screen, and I'll put a link in the description so you can find it when you've finished watching this video. Now, let's head back upstream and advance one year. And this lovely building is the Toronto Power Generating Station. Opened in 1906, by the Electrical Development Company of Ontario, which was subsequently renamed the Toronto Power Company. One of the owners of the company was Sir Henry Pellet, probably best known in Toronto for his house, Casa Loma. Casa Loma made an appearance in my video on how Toronto's shoreline has changed since the Ice Age. I'll put links up here and down there. The architect of this building was E.J. Lennox, a famous Toronto architect whose other works included Casa Loma and Old City Hall. Now, while this wasn't the first hydroelectric generating station in Niagara Falls, it was the first that was entirely Canadian owned. This site was decommissioned in 1974, and like the last one, it's currently sitting vacant. Now, for our next stop, we're gonna go downstream, a long way downstream. Here we are at the Sir Adam Beck generating stations. We're several kilometers downstream from the falls and just a little bit upstream from Queenston. When the first of these stations opened in 1922, it was the first publicly owned hydroelectric station at Niagara Falls. It drew its water over the surface on a canal from the Welland River, which joins the Niagara River upstream of all of the other stations that we've looked at. In 1954, it was joined by a second larger unit, drawing its water through 
tunnels under the city. The second unit also added a reservoir and a pumping facility so that water can be pumped into the reservoir at night when demand is low to feed the electrical demand during the day when demand is high. These are now the only stations in operation on the Canadian side, but they're huge. Even at times of high demand, almost 10% of the province's entire electrical demand is satisfied by these stations. While we're here, let's have a look over at the American side. This is the Robert Moses Power Station, built starting in 1957. It's pretty much their equivalent of the Sir Adam Beck plant on our side, a big modern power plant complete with a canal, tunnels, and a big reservoir. And just like the Beck plant, it's not the first one on their side. We won't cover them all, but let's have a look at one location. This is what remains of one of a number of earlier hydroelectric generating plants on the American side. It's actually part of the third set of water-powered facilities at this very location. The first plant, in 1874, was originally not for generating electricity. It powered nearby mills via mechanical means like drive shafts and belts. A few decades later, a small generator was added to power some streetlights. In 1898, a second plant was built here to generate electricity. Three more plants, very creatively named 3A, 3B, and 3C, were built here between 1914 and 1924. On June 7, 1956, water started seeping into the plants from the wall behind them, causing plants 3C and 3B to collapse into the river later that day. 3A survived, though not without some damage, and continued to operate until 1961 when the Robert Moses plant turned on. 3A was demolished the next year. The wall you see, and the concrete base with exits for water, is about all that remains today, although apparently when the river level is low, it uncovers some debris, including a generator turbine. Now, I did mention the river level, so there's one more site I want to show you. In the distance, you can see the International Control Dam, which extends partway across the river upstream of the falls. In 1950, Canada and the U.S. signed a treaty governing water use in the Niagara River. That included provisions to ensure that plenty of water goes over the falls during the day in peak tourist season. At night and in the winter, about twice as much water is diverted to generate electricity. This structure, completed in 1954, controls water flow. The intakes for the Sir Adam Beck and Robert Moses plants are just upstream of this structure. A side effect of diverting water away from the falls is that it slows their erosion. When we visited the Beck plant several kilometers downstream of the falls, we were on high ground overlooking a gorge. That high ground is the Niagara Escarpment, and that's near where the falls would have been when the glaciers retreated at the end of the last ice age. As the flowing water eroded the edge of the escarpment, the falls moved upstream toward their present location. If we didn't divert water from the river, they'd be retreating upstream at a rate of somewhere around a meter a year. But we take enough water that the current rate is only about a third of that. Well, that's the end of story time for today. I hope you enjoyed this tour, and if you did, please like and subscribe. Now, enjoy the view.